in this new year that we find ourselves in, did you, are you having a great new year so far? Yeah? Good. Okay, good. Um, so there is a common conversation that has going, been going on in our home uh, for quite a while, and it has revealed this thing that I have, this, this, this problem that I have in my life, and it really is this, is that I'm not a huge fan of doctors and going to the doctor. And it's not that I don't like doctors. I think doctors are really nice. Okay, it's not that I don't like going to the doctor's office because I'm afraid I'm going to get some kind of bad news. I just find the whole thing pretty inconvenient in many ways. And uh, uh, my optimism kind of gets this a hold of me and really just says it's all going to work out. How many of you have had this conversation in your home where your wife or your husband goes, you should probably go get that checked out. And, and then this happens next. Like, it'll be fine. It, it's Okay. Right? So this is a common conversation that has happened in my home uh, over the last 18 years uh, of me, of there being some problem with me and my wife saying, you should probably go get that checked out and me just going, I think it'll be fine. Like when we were first married, our first year of marriage, we ended up having a baby and, uh, and I broke my ankle. Like I broke my ankle on the back steps and my wife said, I think you broke your ankle. You should go get that checked out. And I said, it'll be fine. I think I just sprained it. And so I walked around on my ankle for a week and a half, convinced that it was just a really bad sprain until I sat down uh, in my construction job, because we were building this huge, amazing deck, I sat down for lunch. I took my boot off because it was killing me. That sprain was really killing me. And uh, the colors of the rainbow were all over my foot and ankle. He's like, bro, what's up with your ankle? I was like, oh, I just rolled it. He's like, no, you broke it. You need to go to the hospital right now. So I go to the hospital and they're like, how long have you been walking on this? I was like, I don't know, like a week and a half. And they're like, that wasn't too smart, right? It is broken. And so they put a cast on it and that whole deal. A few years later after that, um, I'm at a camp, a junior high camp, church camp, took a, a bunch of youth kids up there and I cut the bottom of my foot, the arch of my foot, a rock in a river, right? Hanging out with some of the kids. And I cut, and so I get back from camp and um, I'm like hobbling around a couple weeks later. I'm like, yeah, this really hurts. And Patty said, you should probably go get that checked out, right? Because it's probably something's wrong. And I, of course, responded, It'll be fine. Yeah, it's no big deal. It's just a little scratch on the bottom of my foot. No big deal. Well, two weeks after that, I still hadn't gone. And now I can't even apply pressure on it. I'm just hobbling like this going. And Patty's like, go to the doctor. What is your problem? I'm like, I'm sure it'll just work itself out. I go to the doctor. They immediately rush me to the emergency room and found out that I have MRSA. Uh, yeah, so I have MRSA, and so on the way to them escorting me to get surgery on the bottom of my foot, the doctor says, we may have to take your leg uh, because the, Mer the MRSA has traveled up, and we might have to cut your leg off, so you might come out of this surgical room without a leg, just heads up. By the way, how long have you known about this? It's like, oh, this is like a month ago. And it, why? Wouldn't you have gone and get in this check? We could have eradicated all this. It would have been no big deal. A year after that, you'd think I learned my lesson, right? You're like, you're a moron, man. Yeah, it, it gets worse. <laughs> so I'm preaching at, at this church uh, I, I worked at, and I was doing this illustration, and, and I had a basketball in my hand. And the guy had to grab the basketball out of my hand and what happened is when he did that, he actually pushed the basketball forward and it took my thumb and bent it all the way back, okay? First service, I've got five services I've got to teach, okay? And I turned around and I said some expletives, I think. But anyway, like literally, I'm like, oh my gosh, right? But I got to keep going, I got to te keep teaching. So I go back and everyone's like, are you okay? And I'm like, it's fine. I think I just stretched something out, strained it or something, right? It's fine. I go home and Patty's like, are you okay? It's all wrapped up in this horn. It's like, it's fine. It's no big deal. You should probably go to a doctor and get it checked out. No, it's okay. It'll work itself out. So a month later, I can't grip anything. Like I can't hold a bottle of water. I can't grip anything. And my wife's like, go to the doctor. What's your problem? Haven't you learned your lesson? So I go to the doctor, the hand doctor, thumb doctor guy, and I sit down with this guy and he said, how long has it been like this? And I was like, oh, like a month. And I kid you not, he said this. He goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> He's like, all the tendons are ripped out of your thumb. 
Like, had you come in a month ago, we could have fixed this. But I went in for surgery and had surgery on my thumb. So just in case you're thinking that just teaching up here is not dangerous, I've had surgery as a result of preaching on this stage. That's right. I have a workman's comp issue for preaching. Insurance rates skyrocketed at the church because I had a preaching incident. I think that's hilarious. But I think it's kind of a story of life, though, because I think that's how a lot of us live our lives. We live our lives going, we're fine. Like, it's fine. It's all fine. Because if something does go wrong, I'll figure it out, or I'll find somebody else that'll figure it out, or I'll do some research, or I'll get in the right network, and I can figure this out. I can solve the problem. And it's statements like these that prove how utterly human and helpless we really are. Because what we try to do is take that whole way of thinking and apply it to our spiritual life. This thing that's under the thing that we talked about last week. Our souls. The truest thing about us. The thing that affects all the other things. And we just keep going into, I'll just fix it. I'll be better. I'll read my Bible more. I'll do more good things to outweigh the bad things. I can fix this. I can do this. And the scary thing is, you can't. And the the crazier thing is, and you know it. And you know it. Because you've tried over and over and over and over. And year after year after year, you come back to the same moment. The same reality, but you just keep going. You keep adding, keep going. We talked a bunch about this last week, but what I really want to address is this. Is I want to talk about where to start. Then where do you start? We start with Jesus. We start with your salvation, your eternity. Because if we don't start there, then where do you start? If you don't understand that, if you don't understand what a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is, then the rest of it, honestly, truly doesn't matter. It's just this hamster in a wheel going and going and going and going and going. And so, look, I've been wrestling through this because here's the deal. Talking about salvation, talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you come into a church in many ways, you're going like, well, of course you would talk about that. Of course you would say that. Like, you're supposed to do that. But the biggest struggle, honestly, the, one of the largest struggles of my life is that I grew up in a Christian home. How many of you were born into a Christian home? Just raise your hands. Right, you came out the womb singing Amazing Grace, <laughs> right? How sweet the sound, and you got it, right? And you got saved young like me. I got, my, my mom led me to Christ out of my bed when I was six years old. I got baptized when I was seven, something like that. Like, I was just indoctrinated. I was just a part of it. And so the struggle of my life has been this. Is it really mine? Is it really true? Or is it just something that I was raised in? It was something I was brought up to believe, and so I have to believe it, because that's what my mom and dad taught me. And honestly, like, now I'm a pastor, and I've been a pastor, and I've done all the Christian-y things, and, and so I can't walk away now And so I'll just keep doing this thing after thing and and just keep walking and trying to figure it out and do it. And all along feeling the sense of going, I'm just, I want to believe. I want to have confidence. And there were times that I did. I had, I got baptized when I was 25 because I was like, I want to make it mine. I don't want it to be my parents. I want it to be mine. But even that, I struggled through it. Am I just doing this because that's what you do? Because I grew up in the church. When Coop got sick, this all came to a head when Coop got sick uh, five years ago, five, six years ago. My youngest son got leukemia. And Patty and I, I remember just going, but I've done all the right stuff. I've I've literally done, I, I have walked the path that you would say a Christian should walk. I went to Christian school. I went to Christian mission trips. I did everything you were supposed to do. I went to Bible college. Now I'm a pastor. Now I'm living the dream. And I'm still wrestling with, is this real? Is it really mine? And it was at that moment when everything got taken away 
that I legitimately, Patty and I were having conversations of going, we can legitimately walk away from the faith. We could, let's just be done. Either this is for real, and if it is, then we need to commit our lives to it, everything to it, or we just walk away completely because I'm just so tired of this journey. And it was in that disparity that we found Jesus for ourselves. That we believed that he loved us and that he was a good God even in the middle of the darkest moment in our life, it was there that I found salvation. Not that I didn't have it before, but I came to understand it as mine, that he died for me and that he loves me. So I come to you today to talk about this because it has been a huge struggle of mine. And I come to you as people I really care about, I really do. And really want to walk through this with you. Can I do that? Can I walk through this with you and process through some of the stuff with you that I've been working through for a good portion of my life? I would love to do it. Can I do that for you? Can you give me some thumbs up? All right, thank you. Thank you. And the text that summarizes all of this is the simplest of texts. John 3.16. Right? The simplest of texts. Isn't it interesting that a passage of Scripture has become so normal? It is so incredibly important, this passage in Scripture, but because it's become so normal, we just kind of blow by it. Like, you're like, oh, it's too simple. But isn't it interesting that the simplest of things can sometimes bring the most profound insight into life? How many of you own a pair of flip-flops? Raise your hand. Of course you do. You live in Southern California. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay? <laughs> How many of you have had this scenario go down? Okay? You're walking on a beach. And that little thing that goes in between your toes, it just blows out. <laughs> right? How many of you have had this right here? Like, right? But it, in your hubris, you're like, I can just keep walking. I can figure this out because I don't want to walk on the hot sand. I can just keep, I can make this work. And then the front of that flip-flop dives in and you do one of these. It's in that moment that you understand how incredibly important that little thingy is (laughs) that goes in the middle of that flip-flop, right? I never realized how important that thing was until it was gone. That's John 3.16. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. It is this passage that everybody knows. That shows up on guys' bellies at football games. Okay? That if you're agnostic, if you're atheist, if you're a nun, or if you're a solid christ following, you, you know this passage. And yet... How rare do we dive in to the truth in which it gives us? How rare that it is that we work through and process through what it is saying on the simplest of terms for the greatest of messages. How powerful. And I would love to work through this particular passage with you. And I have to be honest. I have been lazy, lazy, lazy with this particular verse for almost my entire ministry career. I've used it to support, support, right? It's always nice to throw it into a sermon because everyone resonates with it, right? And it has become for me a passage that hasn't impacted me in the way that it should. But this week, just diving in and studying it. And the cool thing is, is I got to study it in San Francisco, we were up at San Francisco all week, and I got to sit in these like hipster coffee shops. Like I literally asked for a vanilla latte and they're like, we don't have vanilla. (laughs) All right, I'll have a black cup of coffee. Okay, we have that. (laughs) I swear to you, I think they love coffee more than they love people. Anyway, um, but it was crazy sitting there studying this passage and watching the people around me 
and going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't worked through this passage. I haven't believed, I can't believe that this hasn't, it doesn't get me excited. It doesn't overwhelm me. It doesn't want me to draw me back in. I don't understand. Why is it? Because it was too simple. It was just too simple. And I want him complex, right? I want to solve a problem. And this passage was just too normal. Too normal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Oh, how simple that truth is. Would you, could you stand with me for a second? Could we say this together? Right, and I'm going to read the screen down here because I memorized it in the old KJV. Okay, some of you did, right? And so I'm going to read it off of here. This is in the NIV. And let's read it together. You ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now this time, say it like you've read it for the first time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is what I would love. I would love for you to get to know somebody's name next to you or behind you. Just, get, just ask them their name. Hey, what's your name? Okay? So I'm going to give you 20 seconds to get to know somebody's name. Go. 20 seconds. Go, go, go. 20 seconds. <clears throat> okay. Got somebody's name? <clears throat> got it? Let me see thumbs up if you got somebody's name. Great. Thank you. I want you to interject their name in the blank space. This person that you've met or somebody's name that you just got, okay? For, I'm going to use my wife's name because I love her so much, okay? <laughs> For God so loved Patty that he gave his one and only son that when Patty believes in him, Patty shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a personal passage of the 30, 31,373 passages in the Bible, this is the most succinct explanation in the gospel. If you want to know what the whole Bible is about, it's in this verse. Some of you tried to read through Lamentations and it didn't connect. If you want to know what the whole Bible about, is about, it's in this verse. This verse is a summary of the entire Bible. And I want to work through it with you. So let's do this. You ready to go? All right, you may be seated. For God so loved the world. Isn't it interesting that John starts this, this passage out, this statement to the church in Asia Minor, this group of Gentiles who are trying to figure out who this Jesus is because they, they don't have a context. And so John says this after the story about Nicodemus searching for eternal life. And Nicodemus is standing above and going, but I've done all the right things. I'm a good person. And John goes, pause. For God so loved the world. The whole explanation of the gospel starts with a loving God. It's who he is. We only have love because we have God. God is love. Love exists because we have God. But see, we have a hard time with this because we are humans and we are tethered to earth. We have a human perspective on love. So I worked with millennials, young professionals, 20s and 30s, single young professionals, 20s and 30s, for about five years, okay? Young professionals 
these singles that I got to know, were always looking for this mystical one. This man that would ride in on a pony like Fabio, sweep them off their feet, whisper in their ear and tell them how wonderful, and then they would be whole. And a man would find the woman of his dreams and he'd be like, oh, there she is. She's a model. Who knew? That's exactly how I had that play out in my head. And, and, and honestly, our idea of, of love has kind of looked like this, right? Just a dude sitting next to a fireplace holding his girl, <laughs> right? And you can just imagine the things he's saying to her, right? Just, I love you so much. You're my, you're my world. And she's like, I know, you're my world. I know, this is love. Isn't love so, oh, it's so good. You're so beautiful. I know, you're so handsome. <laughs> Finally, life makes sense. My wife and I just celebrated 18 years of marriage, and we've come to find that love, thank you very much, thank you. We've come to find that love is a little bit like this. <laughs> We're just so tired. <laughs> So exhausted, <laughs> right? There's no sweet nothings. I never just like, you want a nap? <laughs> but there's a, there's a continuity. There's a commitment. We have had really high times and we've had really, really low times. And I know some of you have had that, right? And we've understood that, that love is so much more than the one or the, it, it is grounded in something deeper and it isn't it interesting that John starts off this verse, this thing that describes the entire Bible by saying, for God so loved the world. You see, most of what we take on as love, most of what we do in love is actually full-blown selfishness. Because what we do with love is this, I'll love you, but you better do something for me. Right, I, 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 I'll, I'll care for you and I'll be a part of you, but I better get something in return. This is transactional, right? And so that's how most of us look at love. If we really get honest with ourselves, that is what, how we define love, how we actually practically live love out. And yet God is in complete opposite to that. You see, God loves us no matter what. His love is constant. There is no categories. There is no up. There is no down. It is constant because it comes from who he is. It's who he is. And John starts off this letter by saying, for God so loved you. He doesn't care if you're good, you're bad, how bad you think you are, or all the things that you think you've done, or how great you think you are, or how often you read the Bible, or how often you pray. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you understand his love and that it is constant. It doesn't go up when you read more Bible. It doesn't go up when you go to church more. It's constant. His love for you is constant because it's who he is. And that's why John starts off by saying, for God so loved the world. It was his love that created the heavens and the earth. We just did this drive on Friday from Monterey through Big Sur all the way down the one. We would stop at these vista points and I'd get out of the car and I'm looking at these unbelievable displays of God's love. Closing my eyes and going, you did this because you loved me. I can sit on a beach. I can feel the wind press up against my face. You love me. You love me. You created this for me to enjoy because you love me. It was love that created man in his image. It was love that knit you together in your mother's womb. It was love that did that. 
is doing that and will continue to do that. It is love that patiently waits for you to stop depending on yourself to try to make yourself good for God. He patiently waits for you to come home in the same way that in the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal runs home. And the father, instead of condemning him and telling him, how shame on you, how could you do that? How ridiculous, go do a bunch of good stuff and then you get home. The father does what? He loves him by hugging him, kissing him, and saying, welcome back to the family. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loves you so much because he is love. The story of life is this, is that we've tried to do it on our own. So much to the point that we've missed the beautiful love story that he has written for us in this book and practically in our lives because we're so busy trying to prove that we're somebody. This wheel in which we live on. Augustine says this, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. God loves you so much. And it's as a result of that that he gave his one and only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Because the problem is, is that you couldn't fix it. The problem is, is you couldn't do anything about it. You can't be good. There's nothing you can do to earn eternity. There's nothing you can do to earn your own salvation. Nothing. And that's a problem for a God who is love. And because he is love, he creates a solution, a plan. And that plan is to send his son to die on a cross for you. That as Hebrews would say, so that you can boldly go before the throne of God. That you can go, Father. And Heavenly Father receives you into the family. Because you couldn't do it on your own. And as I work through this particular part this week, I couldn't help but think of the countless children that died. In order that Cooper, my son, could live. You see, they would go through these plans. The, it, they would go on these studies where their kids were really sick and they knew they probably weren't going to make it. And so they would put their kids through this study in hopes that maybe it might not save their kid, but it could save a kid down the road. My son is alive because of that sacrifice. I could not fix him. I've never felt so weak in my entire life and helpless, because I couldn't fix him. I couldn't put him back together. These children died so my son could have life. Jesus died so that you could have life. Because isn't that what a good, loving God would do? Of course he would. Of course he would do that, because he loves you. And he realizes you couldn't do anything about it. And so he sends Jesus as the solution on a rescue mission for you and I. Because he is the perfect sacrifice. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 4, 9 to 11, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the sacrifice for our sins, to take our place. Why? Because he loves you. Because that's who he is. He can't help it. He just is in so in love with you. And so he sends his son to die in your place, to pay the price that you should have paid. Sacrifice is at the core of every great love story. And this is the greatest story. We have the greatest story to tell. 
This is the greatest love story that's ever been written. If you want a romance novel, check it out. This is a, this is a story about a God who came to rescue a people who didn't want him. But he did it anyway. Why? Because he loves you. And you couldn't do it on your own. How many of you have kids? Yep. Okay, some of you kids are here in the room. I'm real sorry. We're going to have a real moment right now, okay? Don't worry. Counseling will fix it later on. We're going to have a real moment. Can we just all admit that raising kids is like no joke, exhausting, tired, right? Like so hard, right? Like, wow, it takes a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice. Would you all agree that? Like the, the nights without sleep, right? The constant feeding. And by the way, when they get older, I got a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old. What happened? Like they eat everything, Right? The throw up on the carpet, the running naked down the street and trying to explain to the neighbors that you're normal, right? All of it's just like, oh my gosh, right? You realize you have octaves that you never knew you had. Like, da -da 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 -da. like where did that come from? It came from children. <laughs> Children's created that octave in your voice. And you do it all again, wouldn't you? You do it over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because you love them. You would sacrifice everything. You would give up everything if you knew they couldn't be fixed. And you could fix it. I would have given anything to take that pain away from Cooper. Anything. Because I love him. How much greater is that on a divine scale? When you're talking about God who is love. And when he sees a people that don't want him and yet he still continues to press in and send his son, why? Because he's a loving father. It's who he is. And he sends Jesus in your place. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is what you need to know about our God, is that he loves you so much but you know what he cares about a lot? He cares a lot about relationship. And so it wasn't about just sending Jesus to die on a cross so you could be good with God. No, it's so that you could have eternal relationship with him. That we could be in relationship with God the Father for all eternity. It doesn't just stop here on earth. We just keep going. That's why we can look, at laugh. We can look and laugh at death. Because death is not our final destination. No, why? Because Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that we could be in eternal relationship with God the Father. Why? Because he loves us. That's who he is. And you did nothing. Nothing. Some of you are trying so hard to prove to God that you are good and you have done nothing. It's why you're so tired. And I would love for 2017 for you just to stop this. Stop the insanity of trying to prove that you're good enough, to do enough. You can't. You just can't. And it will only lead to you being tired and exhausted and worn out. Just stop. Just stop. Sit back and soak in these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This had nothing to do with you doing anything. This had everything to do with God doing something. Well, why did he do something? Because he loves you. It's who he is. When we adopted our daughter Miko, with the, the beginning section of this was interesting because we had to take her back and forth between the foster family and our family until we finally adopted her. And I remember in church, we didn't check her in, but I was sitting in church and I'm holding her like this, this helpless little girl that the system has just, you won't know until you've been there. Um, but just holding this helpless little girl in my arms, this four-year-old little girl, 
and just singing songs and then all of a sudden realizing, because we're just in the middle of Cooper's treatment, we've just really come to this understanding that Jesus loves me. You know, I've just come to that understanding. And I'm holding Mika and I realize all of a sudden, this is how God is holding me. That I'm adopted. That he's rescued me because I couldn't do it. Mika could not save her life. But God allowed us the opportunity to rescue her. Why? Because we love her. Because it's what God called us to do. And it was in that moment I sensed the love of God in a way I've not experienced it ever. Because I realized this was me. And I had done nothing to deserve it. He just rescued me. Maybe that is for you. Maybe you've been working your whole life to prove to God you're good enough. Or maybe you just think you're too bad. Maybe you think you've, you've got to make up of it, got to make penance that negates love. That negates love. Love is simply opening yourself up to be adopted, to be rescued. And that's why the, that's why the, the truth of the gospel is, is so good. That's why this passage is unbelievably mind-shaking, mind-altering, and yet it is so very simple. God loved you. He fixed it where you couldn't fix it, and he wants to be in relationship with you for all of eternity. And again, I pause. I pause because a part of coming to church is like, well, that's what you should say. You get paid to say stuff like that, right? Like your livelihood depends on you preaching something like this, right? And so, and honestly, as I prepared for this, this sense of inauthenticity came up inside of me. And I felt like, oh man, I want them to know this is my story. This is me and I still wrestle with it. Because it would have been so much easier if God would have said, just do these three things, then you can be made right with God. Then you can be made right with me, right? It would be, I would love that plan. I would love to fix this thing that's inside of me. So that way, at the end of the day, I could say, look what I've done. It's so much more difficult when all of a sudden I realize I have done nothing to deserve this. And yet he gave it freely as a gift. And I get to receive the love of the Father and live in light of it. So this is my story. My story is I've been a Christian my whole life. And really only truly in the last six years have I come to understand this truth, this passage. And you got to stop. Just settle it. Let 2017 be the year that we stop doing this over and over. Is he good? Is he bad? I don't know, I mean, right? You know, maybe I'll go to church, maybe I'll give it another try, and then year after year after year after year, we just keep doing the same things over and over and over. Stop! Settle it! God loves you. Not based upon anything you have done or not done. He loves you. He fixed the problem so you wouldn't have to because you couldn't. And he wants to be in eternal relationship with you forever. That is the whole Bible in one verse. Sometimes the simplest of truths have the most profound impact. And what I would hope is that you would walk away going, what does this mean to me? Some of you have made a commitment to follow after Jesus, but to, in reality, all you've done is tried to prove that you're somebody. You walk in these church doors and you want to prove that you're good by being here, by doing a bunch of things. And some of you have been far, far from Jesus. Some of you are giving this church thing a try again. And all I can tell you is my story. And my story is I was just exhausted. I was exhausted. I came to my end, and I came to my end in the most direst of places. 
And I don't want that for you because hear me say this. I really do care about you and I really do love you. And this really does mean something incredibly profound to me and personally affects me and personally affects my wife and I. We battled through this together. And I really, truly almost walked away from the faith because I was over it. But when I truly came to wrestle through and understand that this is God's truth, and I believed it and had faith, real faith that it was mine and he really does love me and it's not based upon anything I've done. It is a gift, a free gift of God. I leaned into his mercy and his grace as I do in the wind on the beach. And I understood my adoption. That I am a child of the king and that he loves me and Jesus saved me because I couldn't do it. And I would pray that some of you today, now, would confess that. Take it on as your identity because it's who you really are. It's the thing that affects all the other things. And it will change your heart and your life. Oh, you people who are so tired and exhausted, embrace this love story that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has given to you. Because sacrifice is a part of every great love story. And we have the greatest story to tell. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Thank you for this incredible passage that you have given to us. Thank you that you love us. I just, I continue to be blown away by this fact that you love me in spite of myself. And I, you know, you know we have had multiple conversations about this struggle because I want to figure it all out in my mind. I, I, I want to logically assess the situation. I want to create solution and strategy But this isn't about some Christian utilitarian ladder that we reach and achieve anything. It is simply submitting our weakness to the one who is strong, to the one who is love. It is simply submitting the fact that I can't fix it, that I can't do it to you. And that's where you shine best. That is why the gospel is good news. And I thank you that you've been so patient with me as I've sought after this truth. You've been so patient with me as I've wrestled and to think you're a good father who loves me. And thank you, you're a good father who loves these wonderful people that are part of a beautiful family that we call the church. Help us to continue to grow and learn together this beautiful, wonderful truth. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.